Hello and welcome again to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Today, we're glad to be joined by Senator Tom Unberg once again. Senator Unberg, thank you for joining us. How's it going? Thank you, Jared. Well, it's a pleasure being here. Yeah, it's good to see you in yeah. person. You know, yeah, it's time... good to see anybody in person. <laughs> it's interesting, you know, not seeing people in a while and being like, oh, yeah, that's what you look like. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. You yeah. Did good. Yeah, you're there. much better looking in person, Thank just you. to let you Thank know. Thank you, Senator. Yeah. Your flattery will get you everywhere yeah, on this right. show. Give us the softball questions now. <laughs> uh, right, exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. We're talking to everyone um, about kind of their district and how I guess it's changing with redistricting. Kind of, you know, what's what's your district looking like now that, you know, you've had the redistricting commission, things kind of tweaked a little bit? Sure. Um, well, I love the district that I have. Mm -hmm. um, it goes from Santa Ana all the way to the coast. It includes Huntington Beach and Seal Beach and Long right. Beach. And if I'm fortunate enough to be reelected, right. I'll love the new district as well, even though the, the geography has changed fairly significantly. So um, areas I'll be representing if I'm if I'm reelected would be Santa Ana, Anaheim and then goes up into La Habra and Fullerton and Placentia mm -hmm. into uh, even up into Los Angeles County into okay, East and South Whittier. Yes, it's moved considerably to the east um, and includes um, a lot of folks that I haven't represented before. Yeah. Well, it's kind of an interesting, you know, four years ago, you know, we call it the Umberg miracle, the big comeback, <laughs> you know, one of the, the greatest comeback stories ever told. And that was normally a, a conservative area, Republican area. Um, and, and then it became purple over the years with Trump. And now yeah. I guess is it blue? Like what is it? Is it you know, a plus dem district now or is it a it, toss up or how's it looking now? You are you are correct. Um, Four years ago, um, it was a much more red, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, area, and the redistricting has made it. Uh, the the demographics demographics have changed, and the um, ratio of Democrats to Republicans has changed fairly significantly. Mm -hmm. And so, is it is it like turnout? Um, kind of, what do you, I guess, attribute? Kind of, I guess, the Democratic success in this kind of normally kind of conservative area is it is it higher turnout, or is it is the, are the demographics changing? I think two things. One, the demographics are changing, mm -hmm. and I think the dynamics changing. I'm, I think Donald Trump did a lot to change people's attitudes, right. uh, particularly in in Orange County. Um, when I was first elected in 1990, there were no Democrats elected at virtually any level: at the supervisor level, right. at the legislative level, at the congressional level, and there was a 22 point difference between uh, Republicans had a 22 point edge in Orange County. That's wow. very different today. Um, and um, I think that um, sadly, um, the um, Republicans have become more isolated than they've focused on issues that are not as interesting at least to the mm. people that uh that now live in orange county right it's always just like taxes that was like their one issue like you want to pay more or less and i guess i guess there's more to life well and cultural that. issues too right. some of the cultural issues are no longer as is significant when i first was elected you know big issues were issues concerning um gays mm -hmm. and i don't mean gay marriage or same-sex marriage i mean whether or not you know people could discriminate in employment and housing based on one's sexual orientation that's not an issue anymore. Right. Yeah. Wow. Um, and and gun issues. Gun issues were huge. And gun issues are just, you know, most people in Orange County now uh, believe it, that, you know, there should be um, laws that provide for gun safety. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, you hitting the campaign trail again here, you've been re-election, kind of reaching out, talking to voters, people in the district, kind of what, what are you hearing from them that they're concerned about or they're looking for change here? So uh, people are concerned about the economy. Mm -hmm. People are concerned about education. People are concerned about public safety. People are concerned about housing, and and maybe not in that order. It depends on your you know personal circumstance, and you know depending upon what's happening in the in the uh, in the environment, mm -hmm. those issues take uh, different predominance. So. You know, people are concerned about inflation right now. Right, um, gas prices, those kinds of things. Those are those are of great consequence. And if you're a working, you know, if you've got a family with uh, two uh, two incomes and you're you know sort of barely making it, the fact that inflation has made your life more challenging is of great concern. Public safety also another great concern. Um, there's a sense, and and that sense is 
I think bolstered by some reality that that uh, there are crimes, crimes that one aren't being reported mm -hmm. and are going up, and two even crimes that are reported are, are increasing. Yeah, you know, I know you have experience as a criminal prosecutor for those you know who are listening who don't right. know. Kind of, well, how has that experience kind of I guess help help you know you up here and kind of what are you seeing up here? The things yeah. that could probably uh, be beefed up a little more to help you know people's concern in crime. So um, I have evolved a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, when I first came to office, I had just left the U.S. Attorney's Office. I mean, I immediately went from U.S. Attorney's Office to the legislature. And I, prior to that, I'd been a, a military prosecutor. And so um, I suppose I had much more of a lock them up, throw away the key attitude. Yeah. Uh, and and I've, I've come to understand and realize, and based partly on other experiences, that public safety isn't just locking them up and throwing away the key, that... that you know, issues like making sure that kids have um, a safe place to, one, go to school and after school, safe place to exist after school mm -hmm. and making sure that if somebody gets in trouble, that there's a way to, to basically get their lives back in order without creating any sort of permanent, um, permanent obstacle. Those are all really important. Um, having said that, that, you know, it, it, there, there are some people that can't be rehabilitated. There are some people that, you know, have committed crimes that are so heinous that um, they have to be kept out of society. Right. And so um, I think the pendulum, you know, it swings back and forth. I am a little concerned right now that, um, that while it's important that we focus on those who can be rehabilitated, that, that we not uh, lose sight of the fact that that our number one obligation as government officials is to keep people safe. Right. You know, we're seeing this a lot on the news. You're seeing a lot of like, you know, theft going on with, you know, whether it's retail, especially, you know, San Francisco Bay Area, they have that up there with the organized crime hitting, you know, the retail spots. But another thing, you know, we're hearing about is catalytic converters and, uh, you know, I've, I've had neighbors <laughs> yes. had their gas tanks drained and stuff right. like that. But I know you're working on right. something with catalytic converters. Can you kind of yeah. tell us a little bit about that? No, Jared, you're absolutely correct. Catalytic converter theft has become an epidemic here in California. Uh, my brother just had a catalytic converter stolen and it's incredibly expensive to have it replaced. It's $3,000 right. or more to have it wow. replaced. Yeah. If you can find one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you, you know, the catalytic converters are being stolen uh, primarily for the precious metals. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the things that I'm doing is I have a, a, a bill that's working its way through the legislature right now to require um, car dealers to etch uh, the VIN number or some other identification on the catalytic converter itself so that Law enforcement, when they find somebody with a half dozen catalytic converters in the back of their vehicle, can trace those back to the vehicle from which they were stolen and and, and prosecute the perpetrator and also uh, create a paper trail to the recyclers. So to the extent that they're sold for recycling purposes, that, that there's a paper trail from the person who um, provided the catalytic converter mm -hmm. and they have to be paid for in a way to trace it, either check or credit card or some such thing, not just cash transactions. Um, but it's become, it's a huge deal now, just a huge deal. Well, you have to buy one's $3,000. I imagine right. they fetch a pretty good price on the open market Well, they don't well. fetch $3,000. They get broken down for the precious metals. But yes, they do. They do fetch a pretty good price and it takes, you know, less than three minutes to detach most catalytic converters. And so yeah. it's become... Lucrative, and particularly if if the risk of being caught is is not great, mm -hmm. um, then it becomes all the more attractive. So we got to increase the chance of being caught and prosecuted. Yeah. You know, I guess you have this kind of great experience of you've been here before. You're here, you know, in the '90s. Uh, now you're here today. Uh, kind of, you know, things change. What do they say? History change, you know, is 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 different, but it, it rhymes a little bit. Mm -hmm. Kind of, are you noticing? I guess any any different in the trends, uh, you know, of of yesteryear and today, and kind of giving you different uh, ideas of of what can be done. Sure. Uh, well, it's dramatically different. I've been. This is my third stint in the legislature. I was here in the early '90s. I came back. Uh, for a term in the mid 2000s, and, and now I'm back again uh, in, in this era. Um, a couple things have changed. One is that the uh, Republican Democratic mix, when I was in the assembly, we were nearly evenly split 41 39. The assembly has 80 members. Right, wow. So we were at one point, you know, 42 38. Mm -hmm. And then the year I left, the Republicans took control. But that created a, a necessity to work together. That created a necessity to um, 
consider other people's points of view on every bill. And we had the requirement to have a two thirds majority budget, right. which also was a huge um, was a huge catalyst actually for us to get together. Now, sometimes it took us a long time to get a budget, but we had to be in constant conversation with each other on on virtually every issue. Now, of course, um, you know, in in the Senate, the Senate Democrats are 31 to 9, 31 Democrats to wow. 9 Republicans. And so, um, and the budget only requires a majority vote. So, mm -hmm. so um, the uh, collaboration is not like it used to be back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the day, um, Democrats and Republicans, I, my friends were Republicans. That's who, and partly because I was, you know, young right. and, and those who were elected were mostly young Republicans also. We sort of hung out together. The um, the Senate is, is, you know, not like the House of Representatives. It's not particularly acrimonious, but it was even more collegial um, back in the day. Mm. The Senate was also older. I, mean, I think the average age of the Senate was 70 years old. Wow. There was a guy, Ralph Dills, who was elected in 1938. Uh, Ralph, yeah. Ra Ralph was elected in 1938, who was here when I was here. Yeah, the cowboy hat. Yeah. yeah. Ralph, <laughs> he of the purple hair. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. That's yeah. funny. You know, a lot has been talked about um, kind of the state budget. We have this huge mm -hmm. surplus, so it's $68 billion. Kind of a lot of talks, you know, differences between the governor, the, the assembly, the Senate on, you know, you know, given taxpayers relief, kind of you're talking about, you know, gas prices and, um, you know, kind of what's, what are some of your thoughts and kind of what are you hearing in the Senate kind of on what to do with this surplus and kind of how to give people relief at home? I suppose there's two conversations, what to do and what not to do. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a surplus. Um, we have to be careful to make sure that, that we don't assume that, that we're going to have this kind of revenue in perpetuity. Um, and so to the extent that we can do things now um, to... Uh, bolster the economy, do things now to build out our infrastructure, do things now to provide some relief for Californians that are struggling, as you mentioned, with with, with higher gas prices, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. We need to do that, but we need to do it in a way that um, uh, doesn't lock us in to certain spending uh, in perpetuity. So, for example, um, we have a desperate need to build infrastructure in California. We have a desperate need to clean up our highways. They have a right. desperate need to clean up streets, that kind of thing. So so um, investing in infrastructure, whether it's water infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, is is really important from my perspective for long-term viability and growth. Um, you know, cleaning up our streets and so forth. I think that just it's just important for Californians to recognize that we live in the greatest state in the country and we got to keep it right. you know looking like the greatest state in the country. And then uh, providing some sort of some sort of relief uh, while we're in this period of of, of uh, high gas prices and inflation, uh, mm -hmm. we are struggling with how to do that and who should get relief. I don't think that somebody like me uh, needs to, uh, you know, I, I don't. My family and I don't need that four hundred dollars that, that's being talked about. Right. But there are many families in the district I represent that four hundred dollars is important. Mm -hmm. You know, you kind of talked about infrastructure and your district is is unique as it has a lot of freeways, a lot of byways. And, you know, especially that I-5 there, you know, between L.A. and Orange County uh, <laughs> feels like it's been under construction for like five years now. Kind of what what are your plans there and kind of what, what are some things you think can do on kind of the highways and byways? And Well, we have um, you are correct. I-5 splits the district that I represent uh, in the 91 and the 22 and those in Southern California will recognize those numbers. Uh -huh. uh, you know, making sure that those roads are um, up to snuff, th that in terms of expanding them, it's going to be tough. I-5, at least in Orange County, um, has basically as wide as it, as, yeah. as it can it's huge. be. huge, yeah. Yeah. Um, you can only have, you know, six lanes right. each way. You got 12, a 12 lane highway. Um, I, I personally believe that, that as we um, grow and improve that, Things like light rail, um, high speed rail. Mm -hmm. I know that that's a very controversial topic, right. but those are kinds of things that, that we're going to have to we're going to have to do in California to um, meet the transportation challenges of twenty twenty two and beyond. Right. You know, I, I know you have experience as, as an attorney and a hot topic is always medical malpractice, micro, things like that. Kind of is, is that something you're working on right now, like a micro form or micro cap? So, um, in fact, 
just just this morning in the Assembly Judiciary Committee, a Majority Leader Reyes and I presented our bill uh, on the MICRA compromise. Now, for your listeners, um, what what MICRA is, it is um, historically a limitation on non-economic damages right. for medical malpractice, limited to $250,000. That may seem like a lot, but if if you have, for example, a cosmetic injury, um, this is a real life example from our family, a family friend had uh, botched uh, rhinoplasty and had right. part of her nose exposed. Basically couldn't find an attorney because it was so expensive to bring the lawsuit experts and filing fees and deposition costs and like that. Mm-hmm. She basically couldn't find someone because her, her non-economic damages were huge because of the disfigurement, but the economic damages were not. So couldn't find, couldn't find a lawyer. Um, so um, the stakeholders, the hospitals and the doctors, California Medical Association and the consumer attorneys known as trial lawyers and other stakeholders, insurers, have come together and forged a and historic compromise. Right. I mean, just we've been talking about this for decades and decades mm-hmm. to modify MICRA so that it's fair. It's fair to those who've been injured. It's fair to the hospitals. It's mm-hmm. fair to uh, physicians. And what it does is it changes those limits, uh, moves it to $350,000 and $500,000 if someone uh, dies. And it provides for sort of a cost of living increase and, and some other attributes. Um, Interestingly, one of the things it also provides is it provides for any expression of sympathy from the healthcare provider to be excluded from evidence. So, and this was important, and, and I'm and I'm actually glad it was right. important to the physicians, is that if something goes wrong and they say, "I'm so sorry," you mm-hmm. know, "I we didn't mean for this to happen," you know, "I'm, I'm I feel horrible," that kind of thing, that that doesn't come into evidence, and that and that's appropriately so, right. So, you know, that's interesting is, is because, you know, doctors are human too, right? And so, like, especially when you're in those moments and, you know, uh, it just kind of comes out and, and I guess enabling them to be human and, and not robotic and, uh, you know, is, is good. Well, I think it's good, for, one, for the physicians to be able to express their sympathy, mm-hmm. but two, it's also good for somebody who has been harmed to be able to right. hear that that person feels, I mean, you know, all of us have been in a circumstance where we've unintentionally done something that, that may hurt somebody and right. an expression of sympathy and sorrow, uh, you know, can go a long way. Yeah. Uh, a, a, a expression of sympathy and sorrow can and will be used against you. And <laughs> right. That's a, right. No, that, see, yeah. that's that as the law exists today, that would be. Yeah. So a physician says, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry that this happened, um, that that is admissible evidence today. Yeah. Oh, that's but amazing. should this compromise be signed by the governor and I expect it will be, that, that those kinds of things can be said without fear that somehow it's going right. to bite bite you later on. So is this, I guess, micro-compromise? I know there's something on the ballot or pending to be on the ballot. Would that then take that initiative off? If, has that been worked out? Yeah, great question. Um, the catalyst for this conversation was a ballot initiative that, that qualified that would change micro much more dramatically mm. than was uh, agreed to in this compromise. And this is sort of a new feature here in Sacramento is once something qualifies for the ballot, the legislature has an opportunity to seek compromise in that same issue. And if the sponsors of the initiative basically feel as though they're that it's a it's a fair compromise, then they can take it off the ballot. And it makes sense because, um, you know, some ballot initiatives have unintended consequences. Right. And so this this provides an opportunity for those of us in the legislature to seek compromise and work out some of the kinks so it doesn't have the unintended consequences that, that other initiatives have had. Okay, so this is great. So this does not have to go on the ballot itself because it's not constitutional. It, it well, if the governor it. doesn't sign it, there's going to be a ballot initiative. Okay. So if it gets to the governor, and I think it will, and the governor signs it, then this will become law and the ballot initiative will not be presented to the voters. Oh, nice. Yeah. You save us uh, for a lot of commercials. <laughs> well, the political consultants, yeah, we might want to have a moment of silence for the political yeah. consultants that are going to lose, you know, many millions of dollars. Right. If this is not on the ballot. Yeah. You know, it, it was funny. I was just earlier talking to a, a former um, 
cop who, who did a lot of narcotics enforcement in, in Orange County uh, back in the day. And, I, you know, we we're talking about what was the, you know, the big drug in the early 2000s and in, in Orange County. And they're like, oh, it was a lot of ecstasy and things like that. And I was like, well, what is it today? And everyone's talking about kind of fentanyl and things like that. Kind of what are you kind of seeing down there and kind of what are you working on, I guess, to kind of help, you know, this fent so, fentanyl opioid yeah. crisis? Um, when when you your hair is gray and you've been around for a while, mm. um, you've had different careers and different jobs. And, and one of the jobs I had uh, was I was the deputy drug czar at the White House, Office of Drug Control Policy. So I had an opportunity to see firsthand, you know, the devastation of drugs. That was a you know twenty years ago when the issue was opioids. Mm -hmm. You know when it was um, heroin and cocaine, and, and those are starting to be methamphetamine that were. Uh, the sort of drugs that were causing um, tragedy in the United States. And fentanyl and methamphetamine, but in particular of late, it's fentanyl. Fentanyl is a synthetic, basically a synthetic opioid that can be used as a pain reliever, but it is also now mixed in with other drugs, and there have been huge number of overdose deaths. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the largest um, killer of of young people uh, today, well beyond auto accidents, well beyond any other disease. It's the largest killer of young people today. And um, making people aware, uh, sadly, I think a lot of people are unaware of the dangers of fentanyl and the dangers of having fentanyl cut into other right. other drugs. And so um, I think uh, just, this, just this past week, I know just this past week, we passed a resolution, uh, you know, basically trying to heighten the awareness of, of fentanyl and, and its uh, devastating impacts. I mean, so many families have been just devastated, just devastated. Yeah, because you just, you just hear about it, right, kind of in the yeah. news in the background, and you're like, fentanyl, like, who would take fentanyl? But it's yeah. not that people are taking straight fentanyl, it's right, it's, it's mixed into what uh, painkillers and, and things like exactly that people right. are, are buying. Exactly right. And when people buy it illicitly, you know, one of the um, avenues is that folks, for example, have an injury and they're taking some sort of painkiller. Mm -hmm. And as they um, either can't get access or they their pain increases and they start to illicitly buy drugs and they, as you point out, they, they end up buying um, drugs that have fentanyl mixed in and, mm -hmm. and easy to overdose on fentanyl, very easy to overdose on fentanyl. Yeah. Um, what are some of the things you think can be done, I guess, you know, here in the legislature to kind of help, I guess, uh, you know, slow this down or, or, or change well, the, the dynamic? The, the most important thing that can be done is is to educate people. Mm -hmm. um, the most important thing is making sure that, that parents, teachers, counselors uh, explain to young people, people with credibility, coaches, those kinds of things with, with young people have the greatest opportunity to influence their behavior. You mm -hmm. know, somebody, um, you know, TV commercials are important to, to heighten awareness, but a conversation is most critical. Right. You know, and obviously those who are distributing fentanyl, those who are distributing uh, drugs, those right. who are cutting drugs, including fentanyl, um, that cause all this harm, you know, they should be punished. Right. And they should be uh, punished, I, I think, fairly severely. Yeah. You know, the, the homelessness crisis is something we've been talking about uh, for years now, and it just seems to be getting worse and worse. And the governor came out with kind of a, a new way of, of addressing it. And, you know, maybe it's kind of similar to an old way we used to address with homelessness. I know you're kind of working with something on, mm -hmm. on mental illness called the CARE uh, Court Plan. Can you kind yes. of, I guess, tell us a little bit about that and kind of your plans for that? Sure. Um, this was actually the governor's initiative called CARE Courts, and, and I'm uh, pleased to be able to carry the legislation along with joint author, uh, Senator Susan Eggman. And what, what it is, is it's a, a cousin of what are called collaborative courts. I think many people have heard of the, for example, drug courts, or they've mm. heard of DUI courts, or they've heard of, of homeless courts, or they've heard of veterans courts. And what those courts do is those courts provide a, a, a way to uh, rehabilitate people. So for example, if you are referred to a drug court, you go through the program and you um, stay clean and you turn your life around, then your charges are dismissed and you don't have a record. What the care courts do, it's, it's not an alternative to incarceration necessarily, it's an alternative to conservatorship. So, and they're focused on those with schizophrenia or mm -hmm. schizophrenia-like diseases, the hard, hardcore homeless. Um, and that's about seven to 12,000 people here in California that we've been unable to reach. And 
sadly, their families, not just the seven to 12,000, but right. their families are really, really, really impacted. I know in my own family, we've had, you know, um, uh, extended family with, with those kinds of challenges. Right. And so uh, what the care courts do is the care courts set up a structure for that person with a judge who is ideally sort of the administrator and mm-hmm. to some extent the enforcer of the program, a, a supporter, someone who's trained to be able to provide uh, support to that person, uh, provide adequate mental health treatment, provide them, ideally provide them housing as well. You can't get well if you're on the street. It's very hard to regain mental stability if you're sleeping on the street, worried right. about being robbed, worry about you know the elements, that kind of thing. And that's the concept. That's the concept. And, and we're just, we're developing the concept right now. In fact, it's going to be heard in uh, Senate Appropriations Committee on Monday. Right. Uh, it was interesting. I guess, you know, I, I've gotten this question a couple of times from people now. I guess on uh, Bill Maher over this weekend or the week before, uh, he had some sort of stat that like through, you know, how many homeless people there are in California and he divided it by the amount of spent on the budget. He came up with some number like $800,000 is spent per person per person on homelessness. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like, how, how could that be possible? You know, we're spending all this money and it doesn't, it doesn't seem like we're getting anywhere. Uh, yeah. You know. How would you t- how would you speak to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how they come up with that figure. If right. you if you calculate, I suppose every public program mm-hmm. for those who are homeless or in need or fallen below the poverty line, maybe you maybe that's where you get. But I I I, um, I think that we have tried a number of different things, and some of the things we've tried have have not worked. Mm-hmm. And what we haven't done is we have not brought all the services together with one administrator in this case a judge who can order you know for example county behavioral health professionals right. to provide certain support to uh, create a situation where that person can get housed so while we have a different number of different agencies that are focused on different aspects of yeah. mental health the homeless aspect the criminal justice aspect the, um, the medication aspect we haven't brought them all together to provide this is sort of a trite term, wraparound, wraparound services, wraparound treatment. And that's right. the concept in, in care courts. Yeah, because it's kind of like, you know, you hear people like, oh, six to eight billion dollars. Like, it seems like so much money that we could do, like solve like one big issue. I don't know, like, so. No, and and um, yes, um, the governor has proposed uh, significant resources to be focused mm-hmm. on this. But the homeless folks, particularly those that are have severe mental illness, um, I mean, one, you, you see them. They create, for their families, they create tremendous anguish and turmoil. But they also, you know, they, they, they create um, instability in, in the public. You know, yeah. we, we um, I suppose we have a moral obligation to take, take care of our brothers and sisters that, that have that kind of an illness. And that's what it is. Right. It's an illness. It's not, you know, any lack of, of moral fiber. It's, it's mental illness is an illness just like any other illness, you know, right. breaking a leg or something. Kind of, I guess, to go back to this micro compromise, you came like, this is pretty historic. This is a big deal. Uh, you know, we're all taught about the, the napkin uh, from Frank Fats, where, you know, Willie Brown and, <laughs> and Bill Lockyer negotiated the right. workers' comp reform back right. in, in the 80s. Kind of, how did this come together? How do you bring all these stakeholders together who hate each other, mostly, like refuse to talk to each right. other. How did you get them to the table? How did, you, how did you come to this deal? Yeah, well, I would like to take credit for that, but I really can't. Um, I, what I think what happened is, is the, the ballot initiative provided a catalyst mm-hmm. for, as you said, Jared, the, these stakeholders that have been each other's throats right. for many years to come together and say, look, at, you know, rather than go through this initiative fight again, let's see if we can't come to some accord that provides stability, that provides you know, access right. to both justice as well as make sure that we uh, don't overburden the healthcare system. And so I think that was the catalyst. Fear of the initiative right. was probably the catalyst that brought people together. And um, I, I, I think that, you know, California Medical Association, the consumer attorneys, the hospital association, the insurers, all those folks deserve incredible credit for basically coming together with open minds and open hearts yeah. to, to, to reach compromise. And they did so in a way that they, they, um, they did it in a way that didn't become hugely publicized too early on so mm-hmm. that the detractors could tear it apart because there's no compromise I mean, by definition, there's no compromise right. that makes everybody completely happy. And so, um, you know, I give them a great deal of credit. 
it's it's so tough, you know, just being in the middle of these things before, just getting people to even talk, conference, even with ballot initiatives pending. Um, right. So yeah, it's just a, right. No, this has been one of the age old entrenched battles that that's been around for literally decades. It's yeah. When was the, the micro cap? 19, well, 1975 was when micro wow. was created. So. Yeah. What is that? That's it, almost it, 50 years it's ago. It's funny. We were just talking with some political yeah, law attorneys about the um, Political Reform Act and it, right. how it was $10 for, you know, buying members, you know, or, or people, uh, you know, two burgers and a Coke. Right. And so $10 in 1974 was obviously a lot. Not so much today. And same with 250000 So it's interesting these... Yeah. You know, well, $10. I think it's still $10 old. today. Yeah, it, it is. It yeah. is. <laughs> so the, the best practice, I think, for legislators right. is just never to allow a lobbyist to buy right. them anything. Exactly. Um, exactly. It, you don't You don't need to worry about it if you don't. We don't hear them. anybody asking to raise that cap. So. Right. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. I think Jerry Brown said it was a hamburger, Coke, and fries or yeah. something that, that yeah. shouldn't be more than $10. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, that was, yeah, a, cup that of was coffee, a long time maybe. ago. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. congratulations on on putting that together. That's a that's Thanks. a big deal, and hopefully uh, it goes through yeah. and uh, gets signed by the governor. So, I'm knocking on wood. Yeah. Jared. So yeah. I guess I guess one just last last thing before we huh. get you out of here. I know I know you're a busy guy. Um, you know, we have like 38 members, like this huge turnover, members leaving, kind of leaving early or seeking different office. Kind of. I guess what's the what's the mood of the legislature? Like, what are you seeing here? And and with you know old colleagues and stuff moving on or moving to different things. Yeah. Kind of, what's your sense of, of this great kind of turnover we're seeing this year? Well, you asked earlier. So when I was first elected, mm -hmm. you know, way back when, um, there were six new Democrats that came to the assembly. Total of six. That was pre-term limits. Now, as you, I think there's, is it 38 in the assembly? I don't yeah. know. Whatever it is, right. maybe 38 overall between both houses. No, it's, it, and, and that, um, that is a function of term limits primarily. Uh, the sad thing is, is that the institutional knowledge leaves with some of those folks. And what it does is contrary to those who were the initiator and the promoters of, of the term limits back way back in the day, is it empowers what we call the third house. In other words, that the knowledge base and the experience exists you know, not with necessarily the elected representatives, mm -hmm. but it exists with, you know, for example, the different institutions that come and, you know, um, and, and lobbyists. Right. And so um, that will mean when, when you say 38 people are leaving, that's, that's 38 folks with many years, uh, well, it, with, with several years at yeah. least of, of institutional knowledge and experience leaving. And they'll be replaced with, I'm sure, smart folks with with no experience. So you don't know, you know, Micro's a great example. Mm -hmm. What's been tried before and what what didn't work before right. and that kind of thing. And and that you don't know that that these battles have become incredibly expensive and incredibly, in some cases, vitriolic. And and that that if you don't seek compromise and reach compromise, it, it's going to poison the well for years. Right. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for taking the time. And thank uh, you, Mr. Bonnie. And I us. appreciate it. Yeah. 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 It's definitely. Definitely thanks. great seeing you again. Yeah. And uh, good seeing you. look thanks forward for to, to seeing you later again than right. maybe this session to see yeah. uh, how things turned out. Again, knock on wood. All right. <laughs> great. Thank, thank you. Sounds good. All right. Thanks. See y'all.